Welcome everyone. Uh, this, my name's Trevor Bernard. I'm the uh, Wilberforce Professor of Slavery and Emancipation and also the Director of the Wilberforce Institute uh, here at the University of Hull. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this webinar, uh, which we're very much looking forward to. Um, and th th this webinar uh, deals with something which, is, which I think is extremely important, which is Voices of the Enslaved. Um, how we get to understand the voices of the enslaved and what they told us and how they told us things. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome our guest for tonight, Professor Sophie White. Uh, she's Professor of American Studies uh, at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, uh, and author of a number of books, uh, author of Wild Frenchmen and Frenchified Indians, Material Culture and Race in Colonial Louisiana, uh, and also an edited book, uh, call it called Hearing Enslaved Voices, African and Indian Slave Testimony uh, in British and French America, 1700-1848. Uh, her most recent book from the University of North Carolina Press in 2019, uh, about which she'll be drawing her presentation today, uh, is uh, uh, has, has achieved a, a raft of awards. Uh, it's too many to actually uh, to actually mention. Uh, she's she's been a very big winner on the award scale, to award, award books, awards for books this year, uh, and has been the focus of a great deal of attention. And this book will be what she'll be talking about today. And this book is called uh, Voices of the Enslaved: uh, La Love, Labor, and Longing uh, in French Louisiana. Well, Sophie will tell us a lot about this book, uh, but just just to say a few words about it. Uh, as a reader of it, I've now read it two times, uh, and I, I, I can I can tell you that the second time makes it. Uh, even more enjoyable than the first. Uh, it's a profoundly illustrated book, a uh, beautifully written book, uh, captures in a way that a few historians now working, uh, some of whom are featured in her book, uh, her edited book, uh, Hearing Enslaved Voices. A uh, few historians are now doing about, doing about writing about the testimony of enslaved people. We often think that enslaved people had no voice, and more often than not, they did not. Uh, it's hard to get the voices of the enslaved. But if you're a very good historian, as Professor White is, and you look assiduously in the archives, uh, you can find, as she will show, a number of very important testimonies uh, from enslaved people. And without giving away what Sophie's going to be talking about, I think that one of the things I think you can you can see in this book and in her presentation, and in work that's been done now on enslaved people's voices, uh, is that if you look at their words and hear them and treat their, their testimony uh, seriously, uh, it shows enslaved people not as stereotypes as they were pictured by slave owners or shadowy figures uh, hardly seen in the archives, uh, but as flesh and blood characters uh, with all the virtues and all the faults uh, that all of us as humans have. And certainly Sophie books, Sophie's book uh, details in several chapters, four of which are specifically about uh, the voices of enslaved people, uh, dealing with eight slaves and their life stories in particular, uh, people who ran away, a woman who perhaps was guilty or maybe not of infanticide, uh, and my favorite person, uh, Francisque, an enslaved dandy and a womanizer who other slaves, or at least those not in love with them or in awe of them, uh, profoundly distrusted, probably for good reason. Uh, we see all sorts of, of, of enslaved people in all their, their glory, both good and bad. In other words, one of the things about this book, which I think will come out very clearly in our presentation today, the presentation today, uh, is that we can see enslaved people in a much richer and more fuller way uh, than, than the past. And something which adds, I think, enormously uh, to our understanding of slavery uh, and deserves all the rewards that it's been getting. So it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Wilberforce Institute uh, to welcome uh, Sophie to talk to us today. Sophie. Thank you so much, uh, Trevor, for that uh, generous introduction. And I'm, I'm truly honored also to speak um, to speak at the Wilberforce Institute, uh, even if it's by webinar rather than in person. And um, so, uh, and I'm particularly happy to talk about this book that I have spent many years with, and uh, it's been out for just over a year now. And I wanted to start by talking about the fact that I'm still rather startled by its success uh, and why it is that it has resonated so much. But I think actually um, Trevor's introduction um, speaks to that, and um, um, I'm introducing individuals, um, mostly enslaved Africans, uh, a couple of Native Americans living in slavery in 18th century North America, and we, we, these are people about whom we still know too little, 
Uh, it's a book that reveals sources in which these individuals tell us about themselves in their own words, and that is quite astounding. Um, and finally, the fact that much of what they talk about when they do um, make their depositions um, really concerns their humanity, their suffering, or often the suffering of loved ones, um, but also their attachments, their animosities, their sense of humor, their emotions, and their longing. So I think those are some of the reason it resonates, because that is very precious information. It's very moving information, but still. Um, so I've had some quite wonderful things said about Voices of the Enslaved. Um, and I'm going to beg for your indulgence as I quote from uh, one such passage that stated that the book, quote, makes something that no one had seen seem so obvious that from here on out, everyone will always see it. I bring up that particular sentence because that was my experience writing the book and researching it, that it made something that no one had seen seem so obvious that from here on out, everyone will always see it. Um, because in truth, it took me a long time to see what was right there in front of me, right up until what I think of as my major aha moment. Uh, midway through the research and writing of that book. And I will come to that aha moment. Um, but I want to backtrack to the subject of voices and what was said using those voices, and more generally to the question of how and where we find evidence about enslaved individuals, followed, of course, by the monumental challenge of knowing how to interpret those archives. This is a book about individuals and it's a book about archives, their silences and their eloquence. Writing about the film 12 Years a Slave, based on the 1853 slave narrative of the same title, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed succinctly posed a question that is so frustratingly familiar to those of us working on slavery, which is, which historical voices should be deemed legitimate? These questions are particularly fraught when one is dealing with past atrocities, like America's racially based system of chattel slavery. But then there is history's cruel irony. The enslaved lived under a shroud of enforced anonymity. The vast majority could neither read nor write, and they therefore left behind no documents, which are the lifeblood, of course, of the historian's craft, as she also adds. The voices that we would most like to hear the voices that we most need to hear are silent. This problem of source material is seen as especially acute in the period before the rise of autobiographical slave narratives such as 12 Years a Slave or earlier incarnations such as Equiano's. These published sources do offer richly textured first-hand accounts of the experiences of individual slaves that showcases their voices, um, even when mediated by an editor. But it is too easy, it has been too easy, to elevate these particular narratives, such as 12 Years a Slave, to make of them the default autobiographical slave narrative. Because largely lost in that canonization is a very simple fact, which is that autobiographical slave narratives of this type are a literary genre that all more or less follow the same script and we cannot stress this enough. It is a very particular type of writing that emerged from a specific Anglo-American moment rooted in the captivity narrative genre and that explicitly linked abolition to Anglo-American Protestant traditions. So as such, the slave narrative genre, especially in its earliest phases, emphasizes a trope of Christian conversion and personal redemption that did not resonate with French or Catholic anti-slavery advocates, which means that they weren't interested in these kinds of narratives. They weren't interested in commissioning them or generating them or publishing them. And there is no slave narrative genre in France or her colonies, or for that matter, Spain, Portugal, etc. It really is an Anglo-American genre. But unfortunately, this genre has come to symbolize the gold standard 
what I put up here is um, is some of the work that is trying to contest this model of the um, slave narrative as the gold standard. Um, because I think it's high time that that very Anglo-centric premise is challenged. And what I put on the right is actually uh, Trevor was being far too modest. One of his many books not <laughs> published in 2020 was this uh, volume that we worked on together, um, which is trying to propose and reimagine new models for finding slave autobiographies uh, beyond the literary genre with particular emphasis on slave testimony of the kind um, I'm working on today. So, next slide, please. Though France and the French Empire generated no slave narratives um, in that type of literary genre, there is something else, something infinitely precious that does not exist in Anglo-America and which is the focus of my book the testimony of enslaved individuals in criminal trials. They're not at first sight particularly promising, and they're certainly highly problematic. And yet, and yet the evidence from French judicial testimony offers an alternative set of historical voices and life stories that can, I aver, give us access to the words, the thoughts, and the perspectives of individuals for whom we have precious little such evidence. I've given you here on the screen um, two 18th century, um, uh, two scans of, of trials. One is from the records of the Superior Council of Louisiana, and the other one is from uh, Mauritius, and which is my birthplace. I'm, I'm proud to be from Mauritius and um, have worked in the book on trials from, uh, that include some of the Caribbean from Mauritius, but they really do focus on the ones from Mauritius. Next slide, please. For Louisiana, we have approximately 150 enslaved individuals who testified as defendants, as witnesses, and more rarely as victims. In um, scattered, these 150 voices of 150 individuals are scattered um, across 80 criminal trials that date between 1723 and 1769. Many, many, many scholars have worked on these, this kind of material uh, or similar material, and I myself had worked on them for many years. And then one day I had my aha moment. And the aha moment was when I was revisiting a trial in which a young man, Etienne, 19 year old young man, is testifying uh, as a defendant. He's been accused in a case of theft and he's uh, being interrogated also about accomplices. And Etienne lets loose. As I was reading or rereading his testimony, I suddenly noticed that after about, he was answering a question and, you know, about a page of, of answer. The scribe who was writing this down suddenly uh, wrote in there, and then Etienne said without being asked, and it carried on for page. And then the scribe added, and then Etienne said again without being asked, and it carried on for another page. And the scribe then wrote, and then Etienne said once again without being asked, and the testimony continued. What that told me is a few things. One, Etienne did not really care at that point about incriminating himself. He was just, uh, he was speaking as much as he could, incriminating, uh, letting out old uh, jealousies, animosities, emotions. He was not worried about incriminating himself and the peril that he put himself in by speaking. The second point was that he could speak as long as he wanted. There was no interruption. He could just go on and on and on. And third, whatever he said was meticulously recorded and survives in the trial record. Um, can I have the next slide, please? I thought I would bring you in 
one, um, one little chunk of testimony that gives you an idea about this. And in fact, it's one of the ones that Trevor alluded to. It's from this case about Francisque. And we have the testimony of a, a witness in this case. He's not accused, he's just a witness. So deposition of this man, Democrit, who is interrogated if he knows a slave named Francisco. And Democrit answered, said that one Saturday evening, the slave Francisco came dancing with them, that he did not know he was a runaway, that he paid richly for the drum and courted the female slaves, that everyone said, there is a very rich slave, that he danced and left afterwards that on another day at full noon, he returned to their place with a basket saying that his master had sent him to fetch eggs, that we filled his basket and he took out of his pocket a large bill of money that we could not change. He took the eggs with the promise that he would return to pay for them as soon as he had made change. Then another time he came again to dance, but he was impertinent and insulted the female slaves, which meant that the slave Hector said to him, there is a bugger whom we don't know who comes here to be a braggart go away, leave, we don't need you to pay the drum, keep your money and go away, that since that time they had not seen him. Interrogated, when they saw him, he was carrying the stolen bundle of clothes. Said that he had not seen any bundle on him, only a large tobacco box trimmed with silver, that when he went dancing, he was like a gentleman, wearing a trimmed shirt, a blue waistcoat, a white hat, and three or four handkerchiefs around his neck and elsewhere around him added that he paid the drum with coins and that he had large bills, that however, he still hadn't paid for the eggs that he had taken. What I hope um, you get from here, um, I think my, my favorite part of that whole passage, and I have loved almost every sentence in this, is that in that final question, which was about, a stolen bundle of clothes. Democrit goes off on a tangent because what does he really care about in the end? How the man was dressed, but also that he hadn't paid for those eggs. We tend to be frightened of using testimony, especially that of enslaved people. And from working on this material, uh, now, I, I make a couple of interventions. I have a couple of premises, linchpins to my approach. One of them is that we have to remember always that this is speech. And speech is subject to different rules and imperatives in written text, not least the effect of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. It happens in the moment. It's spontaneous. Two, because it's speech, we cannot... And even if it isn't speech, even if it's written, we cannot always presume a one-dimensional rationale, not even that of self-preservation. We must seek instead to anticipate a richer combination of explanations, both intentional and unplanned ones, for how and why in the act of recalling and retelling, those who testified moved past the factual details of the court cases. In other words, appearing before the court provided individuals with an opportunity to narrate their own stories, to digress, to redirect questioning, and to introduce unrelated matters in an arena where commanding full attention, they had to be heard. We have to remember this. And in the book, I talk about uh, oral storytelling traditions, for example, in West Africa, um, but also um, judicial systems from West Africa as well, moments in which one speaks and one is heard that, that help frame this. Though this testimony can be mined for empirical uh, evidence about slavery, testimony in and of itself does not necessarily enlighten us about the facts of a case. What happened? Did it happen? To whom? Where? What? We don't actually have any corroborating evidence. And one of my approaches to this is that um, I allow myself to let go of this quest for the truth. Um, I allow myself maybe to look at different truths, um, but I think we can't get too fixated on a court case and, and what it means, what actually happened. Instead, um, we have to see this as an opportunity 
to get at the life experience of the person testifying, at their perspective, at their take on life, um, because this evidence gives us far more, I think, rich material than just whether something happened or not that is or not being adjudicated in court. It allows us to see, um, to, to get it autobiographical information. And I mean autobiographical in the sense that um, this testimony expresses how individuals looked at, how, looked at their world, how they evaluated it, and how they made sense of it. Because they are constantly redirecting the court's focus away from the crimes being investigated, we too need to pivot our focus away from court, uh, from the court case. And the payoff is huge because in veering off subject, the deponents offer details that might seem extraneous at first glance, but in fact deeply revealing and very often riveting. And I think that little chunk of testimony I read to you is riveting about dynamics. And I encourage you to read uh, chapter four of the book um, in which I explore this, uh, this chapter in all its manifold um, joy and glory and animosity and community, etc. The other aspect of my linchpins, um, or my, my fundamental way of looking at this, is that when they deviate from the questioning to talk without being asked, what tends to come to the surface are questions to do with love and emotions and longing and pleasure and pain. And above all, to me, these are documents which are absolutely brimming with personality. There is wit, there is character, there is emotion, and there is humanity. Um, and there is text in which, to me, these, these individuals seem to quite literally spring to life. Um, Sometimes, if I can have the next slide, please, we even have moments where I think we can find pretty direct critiques of slavery. This is from the epilogue to the book. François Xavier has witnessed a terrible crime and an appalling uh, moral crime. And he talks about his feelings at seeing this and yet not being able to um, to um, police the French soldier whom he's caught in this crime, that the said witness, seized with horror at such an action, wanted to sh throw himself at the soldier, the soldier who's committed the crime, and that if the accused, if the soldier had been a slave, he would have stopped him. I think here we get a sense of, of moral um, superiority on the part of this enslaved person who's seen a French soldier commit a terrible act but he cannot act, he knows he cannot, um, because as an enslaved person, he is not allowed to um, police in any way the French soldier. Um, so I've made an argument about the act of testifying, and I want to say something about the archive of testimony, because this testimony is contained within criminal trials, and access to testimony was regulated by slave codes. And um, I refer you to chapter one, which is all about court procedure and the law, and just give a very brief little um, account of what that means. Because other than being allowed to testify, we also have the fact that there are written records being produced. And this written record is also a function of legal procedure, French legal procedure. So the process for recording that testimony was standardized across all French legal systems. And it held, this French legal system held that confession was the queen of proofs. The theory being that only the defendant was deemed to know the truth. If you're guilty, you know the truth. And so confession is very important, and therefore testimony is very important, and the recording of that testimony. So what this means in practice is indeed that a defendant could be as expansive or he, as he or she wished, and that the testimony had to be meticulously recorded to be as accurately accurate and comprehensive as possible. Records um, in French legal system are far more detailed, for example, than those of English colonial courts, where in any case the testimony of the enslaved was not always permitted, and where full transcripts of the testimony 
uh, was usually not generated as part of the court record. You might have witnesses or judges who might produce subsequent accounts, some of which were published and read in newspapers, but in terms of the court transcript, there's nothing quite like this that I have found in, in, uh, in English um, court records. The words were mediated by those court scribes who were writing it down. You might have noticed a couple of things, um, even though I'm giving you a translation from the French. One of those things is that the scribe turns the testimony into the third person. Um, some other features of the French are that there's no punctuation. I have added it in the English translation for the, for the um, purpose of making that text clear. The way it works is that the scribe writes, as someone is, as a deponent is speaking, the, the scribe writes down very quickly in shorthand. He then goes and produces a longhand version. The longhand version is brought back into the court, read to the deponent, who gets to quibble, and they might scratch out a word here, make, make corrections, make errors, it's a, um, correct errors, and that is the final um, uh, version that we have. The primitif is the, the shorthand version. We have no punctuation, it's in the third person, but, I hope you noticed in those passages I read that we still hear the cadences of speech. They're not lost, nor are the metaphors, the figures of speech, and even sometimes Creole. Could I have the next slide, please? This is the testimony in a very difficult court case. Um, but I want to give you just one little snippet from it. It's not the subject of one of my chapters, but it, it threads through the book, this particular court case. So we have the deposition of Lao Tzu, who's an overseer on the Company of the Indies' plantation, uh, just outside New Orleans. Lao Tzu deposed that the night of the eighth day of this, this is an excerpt from his um, testimony. As you can see, it's, these are quite long. He's answering a question. Deposed that the night of the eighth day of this month, after work and after the sun had set, the deponent, Lao Tzu, went into the cabin of Baraka, where he usually goes. He found the wife of Baraka, who was shucking corn, that her husband, having entered at the same time, he said to his wife, I'm hungry, give me to eat. That the wife immediately left her work to give him the gruel she had made that he began to eat and said to Mamuru, who was there, to eat with him. Mamuru began to eat with him. The wife of Bahaka continued to shuck her corn. Bahaka, having eaten, said to his wife, give me my pipe so I can smoke. To which the wife of Bahaka answered back, do I have the pipe? I don't know what you've done with it. That he said to her, well then, give me yours. That she answered him back, go get it from where it is, behind the barrel. And having gotten the pipe, he began to smoke, scolding his wife, you too whore for me, that at that point the deponent said to him, why always you scold your wife like that? It is not good. That seeing that Baraka didn't say anything else, he went to bed. We just have one paragraph here, and yet we have evidence that after the sun has set, the men get to have their dinner, the woman is still working shucking corn. Bahaka is an honorific Islamic term. He's a, um, he, is, he and his wife are in a relationship that follows Muslim rules from West Africa. She does not eat with the men. She eats after the men. We have guests eating in the household, including Mamuru. We have a lot of talking back from the wife in spite of her, you know, stepping back from eating. We have the fact they're both smoking tobacco. And then we have the final passage that it ends with. Could I have the next slide, please? I've uh, given you the French and the English next to it. And what I've highlighted here, because I've tried to do my best to translate the French and the Creole into English, because if I can quote the French here, we've gone from very formal French, qu'ayant pris la pipe, il se mit à fumer en grondant beaucoup et en disant à sa femme, toi, trop putain pour moi, 
Toi alors, lui déposant, lui dit, pourquoi toi gronder toujours ta femme comme cela? Ce n'est pas bon. At the point when it slips into dialogue, the scribe has written that down in Creole. Remember, he's doing this on the fly as quickly as he can, trying to turn in third person. But every time there is dialogue, it slips into, in this case, Creole. But notice also the familiar second person, the tu, toi. It slips in and we hear the dialogue. And I've highlighted this because in the French, there is virtually no punctuation. And when I translate it in English, it is so easy because you can, I've added in the inverted commas so that you can see it better, so that my reader can see this better, but you can hear it. And once, once you become attuned to looking at the text and seeing that, you will always, I, I see it, that, that white and yellow, I see that as I read the text. I see it popping up. I see the dialogue popping up all the time, that second person familiar, um, and in this case, um, actual Creole language. I am from Mauritius. I'm my, one of my first languages. Um, it means um, it, it, it's quite exciting to, to find that element of speech here that is so rich. and really quite extraordinary. Um, next slide, I think. Next slide, please. I wanna talk about testimony and I wanna go back to talking about biography. It bears stressing that as source material, Trials, to me, have one incomparable advantage in that they showcase a multiplicity of voices, even if those voices are fragmentary. This is especially important because very few individuals live the kinds of exceptional lives, usually peripatetic lives in which they circulate, that can uh, result in exceptional archival records that can then result in exceptional books um, anchored by one individual. Uh, Full-scale biographies, I'm thinking of the work of Rebecca Scott and Jean Ebrard, Domingo Alvarez, Sue Peabody, um, and most re recently my uh, compatriot, Professor Hazari Singh, and his fabulous Black Spartacus based on Toussaint Louverture. Uh, am I envious? Yes, I'm envious that I could not write a biography a single biography around one of the individuals in my court cases. But to me, collectively, the random and not so random circumstances that led to an enslaved person's appearance in court, whether as defendant, accomplice, witness, victim, this means that we've, we've introduced a wider pool of individuals with a wide range of perspectives and arguably far more conventional experiences of living in slavery. It's those living those unconventional lives that we have so little information about, and yet I think we do need to understand much more. Their lives bear writing about, and their lives must be thought about, not least because it's their own words that help us to do so. Thanks to the richness of Louisiana's archives, which encompass testimony, but also a multitude of other sources, right, that can help us track these biographies. The fragments are often enough to bring these lives back to the surface, even when we only have snapshots to work from. So what does this book offer? For those who haven't read it yet, um, I thought I'd give you a brief overview and then um, have some concluding uh, comments. I've mentioned this chapter on court procedure. I never knew I would be so obsessed with, uh, with legal history. Um, and it's a, a grand tour of French court procedures so that you can understand what goes on in the courtroom and why certain things are happening and uh, what the legal premise is, the slave codes that direct who, and who, cannot, um, who can and cannot um, testify in court. I then have four chapters that tell the stories of a total of 10 enslaved individuals. And there's testimony from many other trials scattered throughout as part of this contextualization. I mentioned Marguerite actually in the introduction. I won't say anything more about her. Um, 
But next we have Louison, an enslaved woman belonging to the Ursuline nuns in New Orleans, and she's stabbed during an incident with a French soldier. And in her 1752 testimony, we hear her insisting on, um, on repeating both her response to this young man and speaking in court about what she's told him. And it's the way that she um, uses that testimony to show a couple of things. One is that she claims Catholic faith, but that she uses that Catholic faith to, and this element of a corset that she owns to present herself as a respectable woman. She is a respectable middle-aged woman who dares speak back to a Frenchman who's about to kill her, stab her with his knife. And she insists on her respectability and on her moral superiority. Part of the granularity or part of the work of, we have extraordinary archive, but part of the work in that chapter is working out what is going on around that time. And I wanna just say something about that in, in this context. Her husband is the apothecary of the hospital which the Ursuline nuns run. They manage the hospital in New Orleans. So I had to look into how he got his training. What was his training? I had to look into the context for her profession of Catholicism in the context of, a, uh, of um, slave codes that required that slaves be baptized and also the particular situation in New Orleans as opposed to other French um, colonial settings. I had to think about her corset and how she uses that to lay her claim uh, to respectability and as an arbiter of morality. And I had to think about very hard about why the nuns with whom she lived and worked very intimately and for some years refused to sign her deposition describing her assault by this Frenchman. And I had to make sense of why these nuns who stood to lose what they would deem their property if they lost her and her companion who was severely wounded, that they did not do everything they could to try and um, make a claim for restitution, which they could have done. And that meant doing a lot of untangling of what goes on in 1752 New Orleans and the years immediately before. I had to delve into every single archival thread, including the convent's minutes, the governor's correspondence, the slurs aimed by surgeons at the authority and expertise of women religious running a hospital and um, their precarious economic and political situation. And that is what explained their refusal to sign the deposition. The year 1748 gives me the next uh, chapter, which is this infanticide case. It's therefore also a case that allows me to explore sexual abuse, uh, reproduction, fertility issues for the enslaved. Um, and it's a case of Marie Jeanne, who's an enslaved African woman who's pregnant, and the 10-year-old Native American girl who's the only witness to this purported infanticide. And what I found is that through the, the gaps in the questioning, or the, this, this, um, these spaces in between questioning and answer, these two, these two women and child, these two women, um, they really wanted to talk about not just their conceptions of motherhood. We have a childless woman and a motherless child. They don't just want to talk about their conceptions of motherhood, but they also especially wanted to talk about their preoccupations with the, how they had negotiated the work roles that linked them intimately together, and particularly their conflicts over Marie-Jeanne's supervision of the younger Lisette's work. The third chapter is Francisque, an outsider who identified as an Englishman from Philadelphia who dressed like a gentleman when he went dancing and whose peripatetic life as a slave took him around the British, Spanish and French Atlantic. His ostentatious deployment of dress at slave assemblies and in courtship in 1766 left him vulnerable to the enmity of rival slaves laying bare these kind of rather artificial cleavages between freedom and unfreedom when the free person actually is the runaway, so not really free at all, um, and, and a, a kind of fight over resources and community support that that brings up. The Igbo slave uh, Democrite, whose testimony I read in particular, reveals through his words and actions how local enslaved communities and their leaders, such as Hector, whom Democritus uh, mentions, made use of French colonial legal systems 
to regulate social, economic and sexual interactions within their own communities. So it's as much Democrite and Hector's story as it is Francis. And I have to say that as I was going through the proofs, uh, just going to proofs, I discovered two runaway advertisements from Saint-Domingue, uh, modern day Haiti, showed that Francis had ended up there, uh, still running away, uh, and this time there were physical descriptions of his very stocky features, his broken nose, his strong build and his agile stature, but, but they don't, without his words, we don't know how much of a success he had as a womanizer um, and a bit of a, 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 quite a, quite a character, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I also want to say something that about Hector. Hector was always tapping on my shoulder. He wasn't going to be prominent in the chapter because I don't have his testimony in court, but I have his hearsay from Democritus. Um, but he was always there um, nagging at me. And I eventually found some really wonderful documentation about him. 1773 record of him in a, in a record showing that he had a hernia. More breathtaking was tracing his lineage, uh, thanks in large part to my, my colleague, Press Emily Clark at Tulane. Uh, tracing his lineage and finding him listed in a 1738 inventory, age 13, listed alongside his um, his mother and her, his father, who are also named, and his two younger siblings. And then finding that he was still alive in 1819, his age given at 90 years old. Um, and add, adding to that information, we know something about his leadership within his community and his authority and his power within it. Chapter five shifts the action to 1767 and a 14 year long love story between Cuny and Jean-Baptiste, their search for a way to be united. They're owned by different owners and they try so hard to try to be reunited. They each try to get their master to buy the other ones so that they can live together. It doesn't work, they run away numerous times. Um, their courtship gives us access to how they think about household organization. It isn't all about love and emotion, although it is about that too. Um, it's also about domestic organization, household labor. Um, and in that case, um, at some point they make a perilous crossing from Lake Pontchartrain, just north of New Orleans to Mobile. Um, these are through treacherous waters and it's a really treacherous path. I went to see it. I wanted to see the path they had to travel and it, it, it gave me chills to think that they had been there, um, but also to think of, of how much they wanted to get away to be together. Um, and finally, an epilogue introduces us to François Xavier, um, uh, whose dogged attempts to get a soldier shamed for a profoundly disturbing act reads at times like a passionate indictment of slavery. So this is not a perfect archive, but you know what? It's not a bad one, and I hope to have convinced you of its merits. Next slide, please. Um, I want to end um, to say, you know, throw out a few things about what next. Well, um, I have a lovely, uh, put my lovely new web page at the bottom there. Feel free to go and explore my new book on red hair, uh, which is not as crazy as it seems, um, because amongst other things, I've found references to human sacrifice of redheads since they were thought excluded from the afterlife, um, matching modern conceptions or jokes about gingers having no soul. Uh, suits my interests in the construction of otherness. Um, the book is coming out in paperback. I just heard yesterday it will be out in paperback in, um, in the autumn. I also wanted to add that I know there's some difficulties with accessing it sometimes from the UK, but it is available as an ebook as well. And I'm moving on also in completing a digital humanities uh, project on this slave testimony um, that will have um, side by side the French and the English uh, transcription, translation, and a commentary on each, and I'll have totally different um, court cases included, including uh, one to do with Jamaica runaways, which I'm excited about and have uh, spoken with uh, Trevor about, and also uh, the earliest known reference to voodoo in Louisiana, which um, I'm going to be very excited to launch. So that should be launching with the Omohundro Institute for their OI Reader project in the autumn, coinciding with the um, paperback. Can I um, 
I, I'm happy to stop the PowerPoint now and just say uh, a few more final, final words, which is that we um, have seen um, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, which has revealed yet again a pattern of systemic violence and repression of descendants of enslaved people with roots in slavery. Um, but what that movement to me is ultimately about is a is a request is a demand don't know how to put it that we think of these people whose lives were taken um, as individuals um, this slogan of say their names we've also uh, on Monday in the UK passed 100,000 deaths from COVID and yesterday was Holocaust Memorial Day as I'm so often reminded when I'm teaching on slavery, statistics are very well and good. They're required. But how much is missed when we only focus on those huge figures, on the broad stroke figures, for it's too easy to forget that each one of those lives, as the news media has been reminding us to do with COVID recently, each one of those lives had family, kin, friends, enemies. They felt love attachment, anger, they were funny, they might be depressed, they might feel joy. And what my book offers is a reminder of the individuals um, who appeared in court and who were enslaved. I say their names, or rather, if I've done my job correctly, I have let them say their own names and tell their own truths. So I want to conclude by reading uh, from the last paragraph of my book. Their courtroom narratives lift these individuals from anonymity, even as their stories underscore the heart-wrenching banality of the violence of slavery. Yet here were real people who lived full lives. We are the richer for having encountered them, however fleetingly. And whenever they did have the opportunity to speak and have their words recorded, we surely owe it to them to listen and to try to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for a, a wonderful presentation. And um, we have a few questions for you, which I hope you'll be able to uh, to, uh, to, to to give some answers to, or, or to to give your thoughts upon, if if, if that's possible. Um, I'm sure that uh, some of, we may even get some about your next project about uh, redheads. Um, I suppose you're getting the Duke of Sussex to be a patron of that, or something. <laughs> Heads around the world, but that looks a very interesting project as well. Uh, and uh, we, we look with great interest, of course, at the digital humanities project that you're doing about these these stories. Um, I think that it, it is one of the, getting getting the, te the testimony of enslaved people um, and, and hearing their stories themselves. I've been doing this for some of my own work. Um, is, is is absolutely vital. Um, so perhaps we have a few questions, and I, and I encourage the audience to um, to send some questions as well. We'll try and get as many of those to uh, to to Sophie as we can. But I have a question from Susan Cape. She's asked, why were the court records so detailed in this part of the francophone world? Um, because the 1670 um, criminal code, French criminal code, requires it. Um, it determines um, how the testimony is, is written down. As I mentioned, there's this shorthand version followed by the reading out, um, followed by the deponent approving or not approving or making changes. So there is a, a French criminal code that, that requires this kind of level of detail, and it really is tied to this idea that confession is that the queen approves, and therefore um, testimony is, is important. Um, and they just, um, the French Empire is a fairly standardized one in some ways, and they export that model so that the criminal code um, is current in every French colony. What is different, and which I did not talk about, and so I'm grateful for that, is that the slave codes, the Code Noir, and certain other statutes regulate which enslaved people get to testify. 
They are excluded, for example, from civil trials, and that is consistent with with um, how um, how with slavery and how they are um, considered property. That that kind of interesting liminal, uh, interesting rather depressing liminal state. They can't testify in civil trials, and then it's down to two main codes, the 1685 code that applies to um, the French Caribbean for the most part, and then the 1723 code for the Mascarene, Mauritius, La Réunion, and 1724 for Louisiana. That later one allows greater access to testimony um, by enslaved people. And once that uh, door is open, then, they're, then they just fall into the French legal system that has all these um, reporting requirements. Thanks, Sophie. That's 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 wonderful. We we might be working to also see if we can get a, an oral call. In other words, some people saying some of their questions. But I'll I'll just check and see how that how that's possible. Um, Nick Evans has a question that he asks. Uh, you mentioned the fantastic seam of material from the New Orleans courthouses. Um, he asks, however, did other courts beyond New Orleans also retain expert records? And if so, is there any variance in their record keeping? Yes, so um, absolutely. Here we, we are back again to that problem of these two slave codes, um, because um, in 1723 and 24, and there's, um, well, I won't get too much into the detail. Um, the, they allow testimony by, um, they allow testimony by enslaved witnesses as well as those who are accused and that is key so you've got a greater number of of um of archives in places like louisiana and the masquerine islands but not so much in martinique uh, saint domingue etc we have a couple of other uh, issues which is so that is really about the generation of the court case we then have the survival the archives from mauritius are, are fantastic they're totally underused. Uh, they're just phenomenal. The ones for Louisiana are, are, are the, the glory. There are just so many of them. There are some gaps, um, but they're really extraordinary. The Mauritius ones are fantastic. Many of the La Reina ones um, were destroyed in a fire, tragically. And from uh, what I understand from my colleague Dominique Rogers, um, there are some problems with some of the ones from the French Caribbean, which were willfully destroyed. And so we have perhaps, um, there's one trial from Martinique, two trials from Martinique, I think 1708, 1711, that Brett Rushforth and Dominique Rogers have worked on. There's one uh, famous one from Saint-Domingue, Haiti, the Macondel trials, but there's precious little else. So we're really, so the Louisiana archives are the ones that are just um, mind-blowingly rich and makes it all the more tragic that we don't have the other records. I think many of us still hope that they might show up. There's a whole gap in, in Louisiana's records. There's a there's an eight or nine year gap in which we have no trials. <laughs> and I keep thinking maybe they will show up one day in Seville or somewhere. And um, and uh, that is my great hope, but but they're still tremendous. Thanks, Sophie. I suspect that uh, saint Domingue trials there are, are somewhere. We, we, we may be able to find at some stage or other, but not, not yet at the moment. Um, we have a question from Alexander Vogel. He asks, without having to return to Tannenbaum-like provincialism, uh, is there something distinct about the legal systems in Catholic slave societies, uh, and, he, and he refers to Iberian and French colonial societies, that differed from the Anglo legal systems, at least when it comes to testimony? It seems that the historiography of Latin American slavery, he, he, he notes, uh, uses a lot of court testimony. So are there things you can say about uh, slave testimony across European empires and across different countries and different nations? Uh, and both of those um, really follow Roman law a little bit more closely in terms of um, slave laws. And I think that's possibly one of the factors in it um, to do with it. I've, um, as you as you know, Trevor, I mean, one of the, the, the questions we had in, in that volume we did on slave testimony was to try and bring in and, and try, try and have a comparative focus of, of English language and French language sources or French empire, English empire 
um, and found suddenly for, for mainland North America, just such sparse testimony. I mean, a, a sentence here, a sentence there being the sole record that survives, um, to which we have to add um, for many Anglo colonies that they just simply did not allow the enslaved to testify, not everywhere, but that they just did not allow slave testimony um, certainly as witnesses or as victims. So we've, we've got some um, inbuilt um, limitations, but I, um, I have planned in another volume and another conference that I hope will, will, um, will um, follow on from the one that Trevor and I did, which is I would like to do a comparative uh, conference and volume on looking at um, Spanish and Portuguese uh, colonial slave testimony alongside the French ones. I think that is another conversation that has to happen. And I think the element that comes in there too is Catholicism um, and uh, not just looking at Roman law, but also looking at Catholicism as, as another shared quality. Um, so um, check in again uh, as soon as I have um, started working on that, because I think those are, um, as you say, we don't want to be reductive, but at the same time, we want to be able to see what's there and to bring it to the fore and um, be a little bit more uh, judicious in how we, we address this. Because I know an awful lot about French legal procedure and French court records that explains why they care about having these records. Um, I'd like to know what, what is going on in, uh, um, in, in South America, including, of course, they have inquisition records, um, which are... Um, which I, I salivate over. Wonderful. So I, I imagine maybe a few people in the audience who uh, would find that idea of a conference very uh, very appealing. So do be in touch with with, uh, with Sophie about that. Um, we have a comment from Gary uh, Craig, and then uh, then a, then a question from uh, Dawn Walker that I'll, I'll put together. Um, Gary Craig mentions she mentions the, the following things. He says, Sophie, I wanted to underscore your point about statistics and voices. Uh, he was at a Holocaust memorial events last night. And whilst we're all familiar with the horrific numbers involved in that genocide, uh, what was far more powerful was a testimony of a daughter of a survivor telling us of a way he survived and of the deaths of his parents in Auschwitz. Uh, and the question, that, that's something I think we, we want to reflect upon. Uh, and a question from Dawn Walker. She asks, uh, have you found that there are any prominent gender divides in terms of enslaved male or female voices uh, being heard during the periods of your research. Thank, thank you both. Um, I, I think it was Gary about the the, and I I was struck myself actually with the, I was struck by the news coverage in in the UK, but also um, I, I get CNN here I, uh, from London, um, struck by how the the broadcasters kept saying, well we have these large figures both for COVID and for the Holocaust Memorial, we have these figures, but let's not forget the individuals. I think sometimes we forget that, or they forget that when they're talking about Black Lives Matter or, or slavery. Um, and it's been quite easy, especially the further we go back in the past, to just look at, at, these, at these statistics. And, and that is important. We, we do need to do that. The transatlantic slave voyages is, is you know, counting and documenting. Um, but, but really, and I think probably it's from teaching this material to my students and having them reflect each time on on the fact that we we can't talk about millions 12 million here six million there we have to think hundred thousand here we have to think um, we have to just remember I have to force them to remember that these are people just like them with, with and it's usually through the, the the mechanism of thinking about emotions and I think the stories that you quote um, hearing from um, survivors of the Holocaust, talking about their own memories, um, that that is, even when those people are gone, we have to remember um, what that means. And I and I'm going to have a little tangent on that because while I, when I was uh, working on the book, uh, around the time I was having my aha moment and thinking about um, speech, oral testimony, adrenaline. Um, and and how uh, you know rambling rambling topics sometimes like could you get I mean you imagine you can imagine the prosecutor thinking could you get to the point I really don't care about your eggs that's irrelevant you know you keep chickens here irrelevant could you get on they don't do that they let them ramble on um, 
but um, it, Leora Auslander has, has a fantastic article on Parisian Jews after, after World War II, and the French system had, uh, the French government at the time, Vichy government had confiscated their goods before they were sent uh, to concentration camps, some of whom survived. And the French government, after the war, declared that, well, if we had confiscated any of your goods, um, we please make a list, describe them, and we will try and match it to what we have kind of secured, what we have gotten back. And so this is quite a straightforward exercise. You know, you just describe that you've got maybe an armoire and it's got this kind of leg and it's this color, and, you know, you might get it back if it's matched. But they didn't do that. Uh, Leora Auslander found instead that in their testimony, it were things like, well, yes, I, I can't find my, um, my dresser was, um, you know, my, my dress is missing. I think it was taken. And um, it was the one that my Aunt June gave me. I'm, I'm, I have an Aunt June, right? My Aunt June gave it to me uh, on my wedding and I had stored the jams in there that I had made that summer. Okay, Auntie June gave it to them. There's jam in there, which is long gone. None of that is relevant to this quest to find the, the to, re, to get the return of the dresser. But that's not the point. The point is that they're memorializing their loss. They're narrating it. And that was very important to me in looking at this testimony. It's not always about the court case. Sometimes it's just about needing to express something. Um, to your question, um, Dawn, about gender divides. So I, I, I um, include many women in the book and I, I have um, challenged myself to think about whether is it just because that's what I'm interested in? Um, is it because it's uh, rarer? Um, is it resonating more? Are they speaking in different ways? And I think we have to think about um, oral performance uh, as a gendered act as well, and who gets to speak. I mean, I gave you that little piece from the household of Bahaka and Taku, in which the wife is speaking back, but she's also, you know, not having dinner with the men. I mean, there's there's a there's a, a all these dynamics going on there. Um, there are far fewer women who testify, far fewer women who who testify. Your standard person who's um, giving testimony in court is an outsider, like Francis. He doesn't have owners who can um, who can give him some protection, or let's also remember that these court cases are just scratching the surface of the punishments and the horrendous violence um, that takes place against the enslaved. Most of that is extrajudicial. It's done on the plantations. We don't know about it. They describe it sometimes, in fact, quite often. But we, we these records are just scratching the surface. Most of the punishments and the justice system takes place extrajudicially. So we have few women. Um, we definitely have few women, but we have some. And when they speak, it's it's, it's extraordinary and worth listening Thank to. Thank you. We, we have a question from a member of the audience, um, although the member, that member thinks that maybe you've already answered this question, but we'll, we'll, we'll say it anyway. Um, your work, she wants to know about uh, work on English colonial law in the Americas, and, and really, I guess, uh, to, to amplify the difference between Anglo and French. Our traditions. There's understanding of this. Understanding, she, the, the, the member of the audience says, which 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 they say is very limited. Uh, the understanding of the English or U.S. tradition is that slaves could not speak. Certainly not after the American Revolution. Um, is that is that correct? So I I'm going to um, anything after the American Revolution. I really don't care about. Um, I do, I do, but I, I don't know anything about it. I, my, 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 uh, my period stops in 1769, and I'm quite happy there because it's quite enough to keep me busy. Um, but in the colonial period, um, it it is so. Unlike so, the French are very standardized. The French love bureaucracy. They like standardization of laws. Um, it is. Um, an empire which, from which um, slave codes are emanating from the metropole. Are they being debated in the colonies? That's where some of them are being formed, but they're being issued from France. It's very standardized. That is not the case with the English colonies, whether of the Caribbean um, or of the mainland. And so it means a couple of things. A, you might have change over time, but you absolutely have um, the majority of colonies do not allow testimony. Um, by slaves, they might if you're accused, but not if you're a defend, not if you're um, 
not if you're a victim, certainly, or a witness. And so, um, and again, just to, to repeat my, myself, and when they do testify, those records don't tend to be recorded in the same way. And what we do, and so I would refer you to people like Natalie Zacek at, at Manchester, um, and, and of course Trevor himself, um, who, who have written about um, slave testimony and the outline it takes. But it, it really, you can find, you can find it. And the, so what you don't have in the French court record, you never have the judge's deliberations. You have no idea what the judges have deliberated. It's kept, it's always kept secret. Um, in the English colonies, you might know what the judges' deliberations are, and they might even publish them in a subsequent book or a pamphlet or a newspaper article, um, in which they might talk about some of the testimony, but it's not quite that first hand um, done at the moment with this primitif, this shorthand version that's immediately turned into the second hand version and read out to the deponent. So so yes, differences, um, differences over time and also um, between colonies. So, in other words, this really is, I don't know if we can do quite, we tried, Trevor and I, and I think some, some later, um, I mean, the material you write about in our Routledge volume certainly is so eloquent. Um, there, is, there is so much deep testimony there, but for the 18th century, at least, in mainland North America and, and Caribbean, there's, there's nothing. There's not. I mean, we're, we're really talking about one line here and there, aren't we? Am I, Trevor, would you concur? Right. One sentence. Yeah. yeah that's one right. sentence. I am the maid of so and so, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, question, we have a question, this, and this will be a tricky one for you because it comes from Julie Hardwick, and she's asking about uh, legal history. So uh, I suspect Julie, and welcome Julie to, to the seminar. Um, I, I suspect Julie knows a great deal about this. So, um, but, but she, but after complimenting you, said it's a super, the talk was a super compliment to your wonderful book. Uh, she's a legal history, legal history, which I'll try and get, um, get, get, uh, get, get correct. Um, she says, in France, the testimony has exactly all these elements you mentioned because of the application of the code empire wide, as you say. And we're so lucky in the French world to have this rich, rich testimony. In France, though, she notes, there's an extra step than you have, have described, and I'm curious if it's absent here. The scribe quickly scribbles a rough copy, as you say, and makes a neat one, but the scribe in the neat copy also elides the lists of questions asked, so the neat version reads as a continuous script. Occasionally, I, she says, she might find, I might find a list of questions tucked in, or the rough version that still included them. So the clerk also smooths out what was a question and answer and the witness plaintiff defendant's voice. So you don't see that stage of a Louisiana rec record, she asked. Do you ever see the question lists? So yes, so we do have the question list. They, there, there aren't that many that survive, but there are some. And uh, in fact, um, I mentioned the voodoo, the, the first the first reference I've known to Voodoo in Louisiana, uh, I'm working on that one right now for the Digital Humanities Project, and I have the question list and I have the interrogation absolutely match on, map onto each other. Um, but, so which is interesting, right, because there's not much deviation. Once they've come up from their question after their, this is after, um, after the investigation, they come up with the questions, they ask the questions, they don't deviate from those questions, they will ask them. It might be a, a subsequent interrogation, but for that one. But actually, um, Julie, in, um, in the Louisiana ones, they keep the, they keep the questions. So you see question and answer, question and answer. But it's usually very pro forma interrogative, but it is absolutely the same one, which um, you know has made me wonder whether they're just you know keeping the questions and then rewriting them as they're doing that um, that full version. And I mean the only and I would love to know if you the only plumitif I've seen that survives is a medieval one, and it's absolutely and from the the article or the book that's tied to it absolutely maps onto the final version. Um, is really accurate. And I wanted to say something else, which is I attended uh, Professor Hardwick's um, book talk yesterday about her fantastic sex in an old regime city um, yesterday, and um, in which there was a discussion of these paternity suits. And I was struck by how those deviate. Uh, they reminded me very much of Leora Auslander's work and what I find here is that there's a, oh, and he told me this, and then he gave me a letter, and, and, and it's corroborating, but it's also just, just 
needing to speak and express um, and go off on these on these um, I call them tangents, but are they really? I think in fact they're they're central to the game. So thank you for that. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Rebecca Bloomfield. Um, she wants to know what other languages are revealed through your trawl of francophone archives. Uh, is, and I think that you've, you've mentioned some of this in your talk already, but are there any evidence of non-French languages being expressed in the courtroom? Um, perhaps Francisco, who was the Englishman, was Spanish and French. Um, so this is where it's important to be focused on one's own, on the colony one is analysing. Louisiana uh, is a late colony in terms of its founding, and after 1731, there are zero ships coming in with um, slave shipments. After 1731, we have one in 1748, and then we have to wait till the 1760s for new shipments of slaves coming in from West Africa. There are occasional slave people who slip in, occasional ships bring in a few here and there, but in terms of, of substance. What this means is that the population is creolized very quickly in terms of language acquisition and also the growth of the population is largely due to reproduction, not to new slaves coming in. By the time we get most of these trials popping up, we have a few early ones, but most of them are from the 1740s onwards and the majority of them are 1760s, most of these enslaved people testifying speak French or at least a version of French. Now we know it's probably Creole, we also can probably imagine that our scribes can understand that too, having lived there for a while, and we can get really nitpicky about when they come, who they are, etc. Um, but the language, therefore, is one um, in which the, the comprehension can can be assumed. And when it's so, the moments of Creole are unusual. There aren't that many of them, but they they give us a good sense of probably what much of the testimony might have been like when they didn't turn it into that third person. Um, and, and we see it in the dialogue. But, um, and when there isn't, when there is someone who cannot speak French, it's, it's very formula, formulaic. Um, and again, this is following um, the 1617 criminal um, procedure, criminal code, um, an interpreter's brought in, and, and it's, I mean, the scribe has to write down, and the interpreter said, after, you know, in his own language, after, you know, they, they write it all down at each sentence. Uh, so we know when there's an interpreter, and one of my court cases, the one about the little 10 year old girl who's actually Native American and doesn't speak French, um, that one is um, entirely done via an interpreter. Other colonies are going to have different questions. I have worked on the Mauritius ones, there's greater use of interpreters but you do not see occasionally a few uh, words, um, but not much more than words that are not French or, um, or Creole or interpreted. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I, I think we'll finish with a, with a couple of questions, one from myself and one from uh, Deborah Morgan. Um, from myself, uh, the question is, um, is, is, is your case on infanticide in the, English case, and, and this is something which is repeated by students again and again, most of whom have seen to read Toni Morrison, um, there's often an idea that, that a lot of enslaved people, a lot of enslaved women would prefer infanticide or not bringing children into the world so they could be, be not excluded from slavery. But your case on infanticide uh, suggests that, that, that one of the major arguments that the woman put forward accused of infanticide for why she wouldn't do infanticide was that she would would love to, that she would never be uh, so terrible to a ch do, do such terrible things to a child? Is the sort of thing which you often find in the in in in, in contemporary discussions of enslaved women's attitudes to childbearing, which sometimes it's, which is used to explain why why enslaved women didn't have many children? Is that is that something you find within uh, within within this case and within your testimony? Uh, and from Deborah Morgan, I guess a, a general question is: You're an historian of slavery. What 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 things have you uh, found most surprising about the slaves about the testimony from slaves uh, that you've heard? And in what ways does that change how you write about slavery and think about slavery now? Um. So um, to your point about your question about infanticide, 
um, you know, I went into that, um, I went into that um, chapter knowing, knowing the, the, the scholarship and, and knowing, you know, having that same sense, um, you know, one gets the senses and, and fan side everywhere. And, and it's extraordinary. It's the only one and it's the only one in Louisiana. Uh, for any any person, it's the only trial of, of anyone, white, white or, or, or African, anyone else, uh, in which it's either even fantasy or abortion or anything like that, a reproductive case. It's the only one, and um, and it and so other than having to look at what the law is doing to a degree in France, but especially in Louisiana, when a lot of, uh, and, and so one can chart a shift uh, in terms of how um, French colonial administrators think about this question, because their, their laws or their edicts about infanticide are really about the poor white women who are brought out to Louisiana in large quantities in the 1720s to populate. So that is the real person, so declarations of if you're a single woman who's, who's not pregnant, it's really aimed at these white women. Um, but, and, and there's really, and at some point it shifts and includes uh, women of African descent, or at least slaves. So it shifts a bit, but um, it, it doesn't pop up much in the, in the archives. So I, um, I took a different strategy, which is to think about that, to think about that broader question of reproduction, of fertility. What I found a lot more is um, not necessarily in testimony, but but in indirect testimony, actually, um, complaints by men, enslaved men, about the way that their women were being treated by a white white overseers, for example. And their worries about them, and you know, um, losing children because of of that ill treatment, that was in a way more interesting. And I did with this trial what I do in all of them. I try to to read through the lines. And so for me, it really did, other than having to deal with with this question of fertility and 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 how uh, women address that, um, but also um, to think about what else was in that trial. And so much else that was in there was really about work, which I didn't think it was about the work that these two women in the same household are doing and the and their tensions between them. So it took us away from being a case of infanticide to being a case that wasn't even about the mistress of the house regulating the work, but about one enslaved woman who's older regulating the work of a 10-year-old Indian girl. Um, and, and so it just grew and grew and grew. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily answers you, but you know we we can't always find what we go looking for, right? We tend to find other things along the way, and and maybe that will be my my concluding comment as a, as a historian of of race and slavery. You don't always find what you want, but what I've found in these archives is has been mind blowing. And I mentioned that there are eighty trials, one hundred and fifty. Uh, voices. I, you know, deal with, that with certain amount of this book. I have, of course, many colleagues who work on them. I'll have a few in the database, but there's so many others. I mean, I, I, I it's so hard to to narrow it down. And in each one of those is is an individual kind of tapping on my shoulder, saying, "Let me out! Let me out! Let me, let me be heard." And so um, much of the work I do is on is on language. Trump, I'm. I'm so fortunate to be from Mauritius. I'm born trilingual with Creole, French, and English, and that, that helps a lot. Um, but yeah, they keep saying, let me out. So please go, those of you who can work on the sources, let some more out. Let's hear their voices. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. But we, 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 we put you through a, t a testing testing round of, of, of questions. Well, I think that's, that's testimony to the uh, the excellence of the of the presentation, and also I think more to those those individuals whose voices we have really heard tonight. So so thank you very much for that, uh, and thank you very much to the audience for attending uh, tonight. Um, I hope I'm sure you've enjoyed it. We have a number of of, of events coming up, and which we'll put up on the screen uh, just now. Uh, but just to remind you of a, of a couple of things. So firstly, firstly, what I mean, which is very important for us, which is uh, discussing our, our PhD students discussing their work on the 11th of February. We'd really like to welcome you to that. 
Uh, and then also to talk about, uh, because we, we, we do both historical slavery, as some of you will be here for, but a number of we were here, a number of you know that Wilberforce uh, is very much involved uh, in, in efforts to eradicate modern slavery. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be having uh, Clara Skirikova, um, Grants Manager for Trust for London, uh, on the anti uh, who's worked for the Anti-Slavery International, we talking on the 18th of March, on the road to eradication, reflections on a decade of anti-slavery efforts in the United Kingdom. And hopefully by the 18th of March, we may be um, moving, moving ahead uh, in our current situation. You never know. But thank you very much, Sophie, for a wonderful talk. And thank you very much uh, to the audience for, uh, for this. And uh, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you an appreciative round of applause uh, in absentia. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Loved it. Thank you.